Welcome to the third season of FAZ TV. Over the next 30 weeks, we'll be taking you on a journey through the world of crofting and farming in Scotland. Join us as we explore Scotland's agricultural industry and experience the passion, innovation and dedication of the crofters and farmers who shape it. On this week's FAZ TV, we are in Highland Perthshire at Mains of Murthley, the 2022 agri Scot Sheep Farm of the Year. Callum McDermott and the team run a successful grass-based sheep system with a strong focus on minimising inputs and maximising stock performance. Hey, we've got 13, 50 yows went to the top this year, um, predominantly an Aberfield as a breed. They're split into an A flock and a B flock, and uh, the A flock have gone back to the Aberfield and the bee flock are uh, heading to terminal tops. Yeah, they work very well. Uh, very pleased to be working with the Innovis Aberfield tops. All the tops, I must say, come from Fern Farm up in Tain. So uh, they're all from the same place. But what I will say is Aberfields are very accustomed to mob grazing, which is important for us. And uh, they survive well on a forage-based diet because we don't really feed hardly any concentrate these days. So that's how they're good for us. Keeping it simple is the main goal. Keeping it simple, not get tangled in complicated, uh, clever concepts is the main goal. Increasing output per acre is one thing, probably the largest thing, to be honest. More animals down the road is the goal. We've done quite a lot of things differently. First of all, we've become more intensive. So we've got more animals because we've gone to mob grazing. We've got more grass. We have improved the breed, we reduced the age of the flock, so the flock itself now is uh, all regular ages, so we can pick and choose exactly the animals we want because we're carrying the capacity to do that. That has reduced the problems immensely, um, just having efficient stock. Resting the grass in the winter for probably 90 days is what we try and do, and that's really helped the ground. If we didn't have sheep at all, it'd be a fantastic grass farm. The sheep in one hand, you would say is the problem, but then we can't sell grass. So um, we grow grass, growing grass is the aim and taking sheep off the back of that. Predominant lambing day, you'll see there, we have been marking lambs. We've been moving lambs to the field. We've been moving lambs from small pens to big pens, nursery pens, I think some people call them. We've then, been uh, actually taking newborn lambs, penning them up, number all the twins and we let all the singles so that in the field it makes it a quicker round. If you've found a single and which is its mother, um, if somebody just took two seconds in the shed and put a letter on it, it just means you can do it quicker. So yeah, busy day today. I don't know what we put out. Uh, we only put about 50, 60 yows out today, but on a big day, we put a hundred yows out to the field with lambs. So, you know, that's nearly 200 lambs and 100 mothers, it's a busy day. The inside lambing is predominantly, well, it's all gimmers and any other weak ewes and all triplets. So there's 650, 600 inside and 700 outside. So splitting the, the decision of who's inside, if it's not gimmers, it's slightly weaker ewes. So sometimes in the middle of lambing and you're in the indoors, you kind of think, oh, some of these lambs are not great. But you have to remember that there's 700 ewes outside, all the best ewes are outside. So what you see inside the shed is predominantly gimmers, lambs, or weaker ewes. So they're always going to be a smaller batch. That's what I tell my lambing assistants anyway, and they seem happy with that. We generally take triplets off, but if there's a three crop mother with a strong set of lambs and fully able to do it, we do uh, let triplets run. It's probably sensible. Often enough, at the end of the year, that field that had triplets, if there was 8, 10, 12 of those, they all actually carry their triplets um, and they get on fine. Costs are being things that we buy or purchase. Uh, one being the high one being fertiliser and the other one being concentrates. Having the Aberfield as a breed of sheep has been good to reduce costs because they survive well on forage therefore um, we don't need the concentrates and what we've also done is we now make our silage bang on midsummer's week if not the week after 
So we're making it when the sugars are highest in the, in, in, in the crop. We're getting really high protein, really high ME. Therefore, that takes us through the winter without any costs. Yeah, so an interesting thing on the fertiliser, which we, we've, we've brought up as a cost, what we've been doing very much is trying to improve the poorer fields on the farm. It's always very hard to get a good field even better, but it's much easier to get a poor field better. So what we've done for the last four winters probably is we've been feeding all our yows right on the top of the farm in hill parks. There's about 200 yows in each park, they're only seven acres. The yows are in there for nearly 10 weeks. They've got nothing to eat except the silage that we've made in the summer. So what's happening is fertilizer wise, we're taking 600 bales of silage to the top, we're taking them from the bottom of the farm to the top of the farm and they are eating it there and they're spreading all their dung on that hill ground. And that hill ground is improving all the time. And one other little thing we're doing with the fertilizer is we're in a wee partnership now with the distillery who have ash from their biomass system and they have 25 tonne of ash. And that's really um, high in uh, phosphates and potash and also has a very high pH. So um, we are starting to take that and use that as our fertilizer to improve the grass growth. And the great thing about that is carbon wise, the fertilizer hasn't come from the other part of the world. The fertilizer is only about one mile down the track uh, and it's a waste byproduct. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a win-win for uh, the distillery for us and for the environment and hopefully make us more grass. We want grass. Edmont is a new entrant shepherd whose passion for farming has taken him all over the world and he now manages the sheep enterprise at Means of Mirthley. Yeah, I'm Ed. Um, I'm employed here to look after the sheep. Um, yeah, that's my main role. Obviously, we, there's things around that, but yeah, predominantly, I'd say 90% of my job is just sheep work. Yeah, started around, probably around 15, 16, yeah, just got involved locally. I wasn't brought up on a farm at all. You know, just something I'd always interested in. Went round to a few local farms. Um, was well looked after actually, and was lucky that we sort of landed with some good people. And started from the ground up, I suppose, and just yeah, started with the basic stuff, and uh, eventually got more and more responsibility. When I left school, when I'd been 17, got my first full-time job. Um, and yeah, just went from there really. That first year I did a, a spell at a farm up in North Yorkshire, that was actually a mixed farm. They had a, um, a, a quite a big pig, pig unit um, and they also ran a sheep uh, enterprise on the side. So I was just employed as an extra set of hands, I would float between the two. Um, and it was f through a contact uh, f for that fella that I worked for, um, he put me in touch with a guy out in New Zealand and said, look, why don't you go out and do a spell out there? Um, so yeah, I, I went just after I turned 18. Uh, originally went for four months, uh, ended up staying for two years, used up my whole working holiday visa and just, yeah, traveled around the whole of New Zealand, managed to, yeah, got to work in the north, right up in the far north, um, then throughout the central North Island and then uh, did sort of a, a spell at the end down in the South Island. When I actually got the, 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 the job originally um, back in 2016, just through an advert, um, I thought I need, I was knew I was moving back to the UK and I'd sort of thinking about where I'd like to work and live. Um, I quite fancied sort of keeping on traveling. I didn't want to move back to Yorkshire and necessarily work there. Um, so yeah, I always thought Scotland was a, a decent place. and. Um, yeah, saw an advert, sent through an application. It was quite quick, actually, I think, b between seeing the advert, having an interview, I think I was here on farm within probably three and a half, four weeks. Uh, and I was actually in New Zealand at the time when, when we, we had the interview. So, um, yeah, I arrived in sort of mid-March 2016. And, yeah, we were straight into it. We were probably two weeks on the ground before we started lambing. Um, so, yeah, it was... It was quite an intense sort of start to the whole thing. My role at this time of year is looking after all the yows that are lambing outside and also, um, yeah, just keeping on top of anything that's left the sheds and is out, out to grazing. Um, so, yeah, my morning starts, well, my sort of hours at this time of year are just uh, a, a sort of daylight hours. I, I, I'll get up and uh, 
first go around all the all the yards that are lambing outside, make sure everything's happy. Um, we've got sort out any issues there, and then and then into a feed round, and that's when I'll be checking anything that's left the sheds, um, and then after that, I'll do a little. Uh, I'll do a, a, I'll go back and check on anything that maybe spotted as an issue on that feeding round or, or problems from the morning uh, in, in the afternoon and then and then the evening it's just a simple repeat i'm just checking anything that's uh, expecting lambs our rotational grazing system changes throughout the year um i think that's the, that's probably the most important thing to sort of understand about it um just because of the setup we've got and um, the paddocks the different types of ground we've got rougher um, poorer pastures that Calm's mentioned that we try and use through the winter periods. It allows the better ground, the lambing pastures, the summering pastures, the cutting fields, good time to rest. So if we started the grazing sort of system from the spring, when everything leaves the sheds, we set stock. So we'll take a certain area and that will be allocated a, a set number of yows, whether that's ones that have left the shed or ones that are due to lamb. Once the whole lambing cycle's finished, everything's we're happy with everything. I'll start mobbing um, yows and lambs up. Uh, we tend to graze our twin mobs in the region of 220 to 250 yows. Um, it just suits our system. It suits the size of the fang. It's enough for me to bring that mob in on my own, uh, sort through the lambs if I'm needing to treat uh, anything. Um, that's sort of a good size and we'll take the single mobs up to about 350 um, we had one lot there 370 it, it for the size of paddocks we've got again size of handling facilities that's sort of the size of mobs we run and they'll be those those mobs um, like I say from sort of mid to end of May will be almost up to full size um, and then we'll be yeah rotating them in blocks uh, around the farm. So yeah, in terms of grazing, we're probably, or how would I put it, we're maybe not super scientific and super technical on how we do it. It's, we get it down to, I would say a 35 to 40 day rotation. We'll be grazing on average each paddock for three to five days um, so that gives you a rough idea in terms of in terms of uh, each mob moving around their zone of the farm that's sort of how we how we run it at the minute it's very much uh, if we if we we end up with too much grass in front of one mob we'll shut that paddock off and we could perhaps look at using that field as a cutting field vice versa if we've not got enough grass in front We'll hold off shutting any fields off for, for cutting, for making forage. Um, yeah, that's sort of a rough uh, idea of how we balance it. Like Callum, Ed is a firm believer in trying to make the sheep system as efficient as possible, which has led to them introducing a new tagging routine at lambing time. It's like with anything, I think if you just, Callum touched on it earlier, keep your management system simple. Like, well, once a ewe lamb is born, uh, she'll be given a double colour of that year um, that tag then stays with her for life so if we ever if she ever loses a tag we buy a like for like tag it gets replaced back into so she never loses that original identity yeah we run a different color for every year probably my favorite management tool that we use is a set of ear notches so throughout the year if i ever have a problem um, for example a lame yow uh, she'll get a clip out of the back of her left ear that just tells me, right, this yow, she's had an issue. We then sort it. If four weeks, five weeks down the line, she's still got an issue, she'll get another tag behind her ear. That then means she's a cull. So as soon as she falls out of the um, the lambing system, I suppose, once she's spained her lambs, she'll be fattened up and she'll be down the road. It's same with the likes of prolapse, problem meows at, um, at birth. Yeah, what else? Bad teats, bad teeth anything we tape uh, that's a direct call clip out the right ear it just it's just it makes my life easier when i'm shedding yows once we've spained lambs i can see her straight away i don't need to necessarily mouth everything that day i've got 
150 owls that we've that were probably used throughout the summer, they're already shed off. We can focus on getting them fattened up and down the road. Going back to the tagging, um, a, a new thing we've done. Um, we keep all our male single-born lambs entire. We just dock the tail. It's a thing we've trialled last year, at just trying to speed up the fattening process. We feel like it doesn't reduce, they, it doesn't give them any sort of check at lambing. Um, so they hit the ground and they just hit the ground running. They stay tagless until the day they leave the farm, just for a management, um, so they're easier to spot. Male-born twin lambs get a, a one-ear tag and all female born uh, lambs get two coloured tags. So we were lucky enough to, well firstly to get put forward, uh, nominated for the Agri Scott Sheep Farmer Award um, and yeah, I don't know whether, whether it was fully deserved but yeah we managed to come uh, come away and we'd won, won, won the award. I think, yeah I mean it, it, firstly, I mean it, yeah it's great, you know have a bit of recon, um, recognition I suppose for, for hard the, you know, hard work that we've done, the, the, the things that we've sort of tidied up around our systems. Yeah, I mean, it came around as a, uh, as a surprise. We, we, were, we were pretty shocked um, when we first sort of heard about it. We ummed and hard whether to go through the, with the process because we're certainly not where we want to be. We've still got a lot of stuff we want to improve on. We've come a long way from where we were, uh, I suppose, um, since I first started here and how we want to run the sheep system. Um, so we were reluctant, but we thought, well, we may never, you, you know, you get, you have to, you have to be put forward to the award. So we thought, well, we may never have the chance. Let's do it. It'll be a good experience. And if anything, I think it, it, it gave us chance to really look at the system and make sure that we were doing everything we'd set out to do. It's all well and good. Um, us chatting about stuff we want to do, but actually, are we putting all these things in place? Um, so it was a good sort of kick up the backside, I suppose, just to. Remind us that we need to keep the ball moving, keep keep you know improving what we're trying to do. Yeah, the day they came, um, it was yeah it was interesting. We we weren't sure what they wanted to see, so we um, yeah just it was just a day like this. Yeah, just come see what we get up to. Yeah, they were quite keen to see where we you know what we were trying to do, where we're doing what we were what we were doing. Yeah, it was about how we manage the flock I suppose and you know what are our what are the aims what are we trying to what we're trying to where we're trying to take take the, the the sheep farming business I suppose yeah I would say that was probably their main interest of you know just understanding from a sheep uh, enterprise um, sheep business enterprise you know what are you guys you know how do you work it and what are you guys working towards well we're lucky this year we got two students came back again they were here last year and they've come back again uh, so in theory they knew what they were doing but we're not very sure about that but anyway they did really well it's nice to have them one's a vet student second year and one is a second year ag student one at edinburgh and one in aberdeen we're always very keen on the farm to make sure that we look after young people we have school kids on the farm every week and funny enough they're coming tomorrow because they're back at school they're all coming tomorrow to see what it's all about looking after young people is our goal so I'm Charlotte and I'm a second year vet student in Edinburgh so um, sort of through the course it's five years um, first two years you do sort of more animal husbandry and then the last three years is more clinical based so the first two years at which I'm just finishing up you come out and do sort of lambing work like this so you get the hands-on experience so if you're called out or something you know the basics and you can cover it and um, so that's really why I'm here just to gather more experience and because, yeah, just get hands-on with it and learn it a bit better. I'm Prakash and I'm a second-year yeah. agri student at Aberdeen SOUC. Yeah, the course, it's good. The first year that I did was the NC, which is like an entry course, um, which is very practical-based, which helps... It's aimed to help younger people get practical experience, like, within agriculture, um, like, out with school and still have it academically based. Um, and then in progressing into like first and second year, you're slowly starting to do more class stuff and lectures and it's more pinpoint and it's, it's not necessarily just, uh, you know, like cattle and sheep. They sort of break it down into much smaller points of like crops and specifics of crops and it's, it's very specific, um, which helps 
for like when you want to progress. It's it's not just one thing. It really gives you a wide variety of what you want to do. If it's not necessarily just you want to go and farm and you want to go back home, you can go and do different things. So this morning we sort of started checking all the lambs are sort of milked and got full bellies, um, and then go around and mark. So you sort of take off uh, the tails and castrate the, the males and then tag them um, and just sort of like spray them so you know who the mums are and whatnot. I feel the experience, especially in agriculture, is really good to have and not just, you know, textbook stuff. The experience is definitely good to have. I've found it sort of, it's quite vital in the way because it's sort of like there's only so much you can actually get taught sat in a classroom because um, I was saying to Callum the other day it's like when you're in first year and um, they teach you how to lamb a sheep and actually when you come to lamb a sheep it's nothing like the way you're, you're doing with a practical with a bathtub in, in the lab and um, so it's actually hands-on experience and it's it helps sort of learn on the job because there's no better way to actually learn a skill than sort of hands-on experience. I think it's quite good here I've found it sort of like they have all the experience and stuff, but it's like sometimes they'll just be like, right, you guys try and figure it out for yourself and if you get really stuck, just give us a call and they'll be there and they're, they're quite good at sort of, again, just learning what you can. Having spent the day with Callum and the team at Means of Murthley, what advice would they give to other farmers and crofters across Scotland? Keeping it simple is, is very much something. So uh, with the staff that we work with uh, and always have worked with, Having a simple plan and actually sticking to it has um, been very much advantageous. Being efficient. Uh, so on the farm here, uh, you may have seen over the last uh, few hours that we have efficient, we have systems. And if everybody understands the same system, then anyone can pick up and, and carry on where it's been left off. And uh, more and more, I think in the last five years, we've started recording stock I've always been recording costs and, and inputs and outputs, so we have that tabulated for years back. But now having the stock and the grass, we're starting to measure grass as well, so we're getting sizes of everything, outputs and growths and productivity, I suppose. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the first vet update for season three of Fast TV. It's Highland Show Week, so I hope many of you are getting ready to, to go through to celebrate the best of farming and to meet up with old friends. It has been hot for, for weeks now and it's taking its toll on us and it's taking our, its toll on our, our livestock as, as well. One of the most important things to remember in the hot weather is to ensure that, that all your livestock have got access to plentiful clean drinking water. In recent weeks, we've had reports of cattle showing perhaps neurological type signs, so circling or being a bit wobbly on their feet or perhaps appearing blind. And we're suspicious that this could be due to water deprivation. And water deprivation means that, that cattle can suffer from salt toxicity. The issue can then be, if these cattle then go and drink lots of water, they can then take too much water on board, which causes their brains to swell and cause more neurological signs. So do be alert to that and, and we need to, to, to prevent this from happening in the first place by ensuring they've got a constant access to water. It's not just water deprivation or water toxicity that can cause these neurological signs. So we've also had cases of lead poisoning in recent weeks. Very often this will be from a discarded car battery that's, that's in a field that cattle have had access to. But again, this can, can present as blindness, perhaps seizures, perhaps sudden deaths. So if you are getting these signs, please do make sure that you get your vet involved so that we get the right diagnosis. In the heat, feed intakes will be down as well, and this will cause issues in, in many animals. It will affect growth rates, but in, in dairy cows in particular, it can cause lots of problems with transition cow management. So a decrease in feed intakes will increase metabolic diseases associated with transition cows. So we've been seeing increased incidence of milk fever, of ketosis, and displaced abomasums. In suckler herds, we're seeing outbreaks of pneumonia in suckled calves at grass, which again we think are likely to be related to, to heat stress affecting these calves. In some cases, it might be that there's been a previous episode of pneumonia, particularly in calves that were born inside, might have had 
old pneumonia lesions that have now flared up in the hot weather or in other calves it might be that immunosuppression is leading to, to an increased risk of pneumonia so if there are trace element deficiencies or if there's tick-borne fever causing immunosuppression these can make calves more prone to, to pneumonia. Lungworm can be a cause of calves coughing at grass. It's probably a little bit early in the season for that, but in the coming weeks this could become more of a concern. So again, get your vet involved so that we can ensure that we know what the, the reason for the coughing is and get the right treatment and prevention in place. Do take care if you're needing to, to handle sheep in this hot weather. Clearly it's, it's best to avoid the hottest parts of the day and, and, and work early in the morning or, or later in the evening so that it's cooler. This is for you and for the sheep and, and obviously for your, for your dogs as well. In this hot weather, fly strike can be a real concern, so speak to your vet about the best way to prevent that or to treat it if it's necessary. Lambs that are scouring are going to be more at risk of, of fly strike, and we have seen many outbreaks of diarrhoea due to nematodiaris in the last few weeks. Nematodiaris can hatch when the, when the warm weather comes, and so in many parts of Scotland, the peak hatch is over, but in some parts of, of Scotland, particularly further north, the peak hatch is still to come. So do be alert to that. Nematodiris can present as sudden deaths in lambs, but there are other causes of sudden death that we see at this time of year. So we've had outbreaks of clostridial disease, such as pulpy kidney, particularly in lambs that haven't been vaccinated yet, or indeed if their, their mothers haven't had vaccination so that they've got protection from their, their mother's colostrum. So thank you for listening. We'll, we'll see you next month. I hope the weather holds, but that we get a little bit more rain to cool us down and to, to let the grass grow.